My name's James Titcomb. You know, my life changed when we were expecting our second child, which we knew was going to be a baby boy. And um, the, you know, the happy day came and Joshua was born. Beautiful, healthy baby boy. But shortly after he was born, um, my wife became very poorly. She actually had sepsis and she was given fluids and antibiotics and recovered. Um, but all the time, you know, we were asking about Joshua, is he OK? And we were told by the midwives, actually, Joshua is fine. There's nothing you need to worry about. And you kind of accept that. You're in a kind of position where you think um, these people do this every day. I'm the one that's panicking. I'll accept what I'm told. But sadly, uh, Joshua wasn't okay. Um, he really needed to see a paediatrician. He really needed some antibiotics. Um, he was in a bad way. And for the next 24 hours, that didn't happen. He had lots of signs of sepsis that we now know were, should have been clear indications that he needed to see a paediatrician. None of those signs were acted on. And at 24 hours of age, he collapsed. He was transferred to the special care baby unit, first to Manchester and then by helicopter to Newcastle, where he was put on a um, kind of heart and lung machine for babies. His lungs started to bleed. That became catastrophic bleeding. And yeah, at nine days old, uh, his bleeding was so profuse that they had to turn the ECMO machine off and let Joshua die. So world turned upside down, absolutely. But. I suppose, you know, on reflection, the biggest shock for us was how the NHS and the system then responded. I believe it's one of the best places to, you, you can be. The flexibility from organisations are amazing, the rewards are amazing in terms of what you're getting back from patients, from clients, from service users, etc. The environment that our staff create for healing uh, and recovery, uh, we've talked about the need for compassion, um, and our staff ooze that, but they don't always feel that from the bureaucracy that's associated with the sector that we work in. My name is Sydney Decker. I am a professor at Griffith University and I'm director of the Safety Science Innovation Lab. James Titcomb's case is not unique. In our experience that stretches over decades and, and across national borders and in fact across industries, we have seen that the failures caused in these systems are at least as complex as the systems that bring them forth. People have very strong preconceived ideas in healthcare and, and I think I understand more now why that is. It's because the price of an error in healthcare is really, really high. And so you can see how failure and getting it wrong is not something we're well rehearsed in and not something that we are comfortable with. The uh, future is implausible, the past incredible. In a complex system, the engineers are good, the analysts are good, and they work on ways to make the system robust in the face of, of certain kinds of failures, single failures, certain well-modeled failures. However, once the accident occurs and we look backwards, we go, how could those people have missed that signal? How could they have not prioritized this goal over this other goal? How did they not recognize they should have taken the time to be extra thorough when they were under pressure to be super efficient? And so the past looks incredible. In medicine, um, as in many industries, there's obviously historically been a lot of heroic leadership, the consultant, the professor, the boss, and very much you were told what to do. And fear drove a lot of, of poor feeling and poor relationships between staff, including between nursing and medical staff. Psychological safety is absolutely critical. So how teams work, the relationships within the team, the relationships with the manager, do they feel able to tell the boss bad news? Classically, uh, some of the surgeons when I was training were actually violent towards staff, um, that was well known. And often there was compliance, but often there wasn't actually. When I look back in it, I can think of examples where patient care probably suffered. So we started to escape hindsight bias and go back and reconstruct what the view looked like at the sharp end of real practitioners. How do they make the system work? And that led us to emphasize that people create safety. I thought the very least we would get a kind of, you know, there'd be an investigation, they'd leave no stone unturned. 
In fact, what happened was um, the hospital rang us a few weeks after Joshua died and told us that um, you know, they'd lost some critical records. And it turned out that the records that they'd lost were all of his observations from the time when he was born to the time he collapsed. We then went through this kind of agonising process of saying, you know, well, we're not happy with the trust investigation, where can we go? And, you know, I remember thinking at the time, it's not like I've got a faulty washing machine, I shouldn't be making a complaint, this is a, a serious patient safety matter, this should be being investigated, it shouldn't be taking me to drive this process. It's become willy-nilly a thing of regulate what you can and ignore everything else. And it has to be. I mean, it's, it's, if you're going to have a bureaucratic system, the bureaucrats have to be able to ha exercise some level of control. They exercise their level of control by setting criteria and establishing um, uh, requirements that may be or may not be related to the quality of clinical care, but serve their needs and the needs of that large bureaucracy. And that's what we have. At that point, we went back to the coroner in Newcastle, who had initially refused to open an inquest and persuaded him to open an inquest. It found very significant problems, it, it, you know, 10 failures in care. Um, the coroner accused the midwives of collaborating over their evidence. He didn't believe that what they were saying was honest. This actually triggered a criminal investigation. Um, the regulators then went into the unit where Joshua was born and found major risks to mothers and babies. And, you know, at that point, I met, met other families who had common features in, in the loss of their children and campaigned for a, a big national inquiry, which we, we got, the Morecambe Bay investigation chaired by Dr Bill Kirkup. And what, what that found was, um, you know, there was a lethal mix of failures, actually, at every level of the system. And in fact, 11 babies and one mother had died at that unit. Tragically, six of those deaths happened after Joshua died. I think one of the things with incidents is you always ask what happened, but then it doesn't go that next step to say how are you feeling about that? What can we do to help you through this, as well as supporting you know, the rest of the patients or the, if it's been a death, the, the family of that patient. A lot of focus is put on the patients, but the, the staff are just left to carry on really and get on with things. Every incident creates multiple victims. There is the first victim. This would be the, the, the patient in this case or, or their family. Around that is the second victim or victims. This would be the, the caregiver or the practitioner, the professional who is involved in the incident and feels personally guilty and responsible for it. It doesn't just finish immediately after that. And if it has been a death, you're then probably looking at coroner's court and then you're recalling it all again. So you might have been able to put it out of your mind for a bit, but then it's all back again. And the staff have to go to that, and they have to, um, you know, be supported through that as well, because that, that's a very stressful event. They're so fearful of the consequences of being honest. They are not ill-intentioned. They are not lackadaisical. They are not uncaring. In fact, if they have become uncaring, it's largely due to the interposition of this large bureaucratic monstrosity between you and them. But they are human beings. And if you can somehow get in touch with them, or let them get in touch with you, the results are likely to be very, very good. And I kind of reflect on what happened to Joshua. And I think, you know, had those, um, for whatever reason, staff were fearful. Um, they were unable to be open and honest. The trust was unable to be open and honest, and that resulted in the very worst outcome for everybody, which was a terrible ordeal for us, and more importantly, other people being put at risk. And I think to say, hang on a minute, you know, we're all humans, um, we work in a complex system, um, errors will, will happen, um, and as long as you have openness and honesty, as long as staff feel able to be open and honest and safe in, in the process of investigation and learning, we can do what's really important here. This is the way to learn from failure. Don't just stop at the most convenient person or party to blame. No, if you want to learn from failure, you have to engage in a genuine and honest learning review of your own organization's performance. A learning review that is immediate, that is independent, that's expert driven. 
What's important isn't removing a person from a system, only to leave the same system in place for the next person to, to, to fall into that trap. What's really important is what do we need to change here? And no, it won't give you your 15 second answer as to why you were made to suffer in this particular case. But if it's done well, what it will do is show you the complexity of failure. It will show you that these were normal people doing normal things, doing what made sense to them at the time, given their goals, given their knowledge, given their focus of attention. Normal people in what looked to everybody to be a normal organization, just like any other. And when you do that, you will identify powerful levers for change and improvement. One of the changes that, that's happened since Morecambe Bay actually is also at a national level. So um, we now have this new organisation, the Healthcare Safety Investigation Branch, which is actually from April this year going to take a lead on all deaths like Joshua's, so all term neonatal deaths and stillbirths and actually babies who were brain damaged um, or potentially brain damaged. And I think if, if HSIB can model um, you know, an investigation that looks beyond the individual actions of people to a level, you know, a deeper level that says actually what was the environment, what was the context in which this happened, and what do we need to change, um, then I think that could be a really useful, useful process and something, something the whole system can learn from.